Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. Very special episode we've got going on today in honor of Cigar Rights of America. This segment is brought to you by the Havana Cigar Club. Come spend the afternoon with one of the best master blenders in the industry. Attend in person or participate live through stogiegeeks.com. You can go to stogiegeeks.com forward slash blending. It's actually Havana Cigar Club. Is that, that We got the wrong ad on the video. I, sorry. Miscommunication. <laughs> uh, so stogiegeeks.com forward slash blending. You can attend virtually and you get all the cigars that are included in the blending seminar and get to participate virtually. Or if you're here in Rhode Island, you can attend live. Again, stogiegeeks.com forward slash blending. All participants receive a preferito blending kit that comes in a custom box made just for Manuel uh, blending seminar contestants, so to speak. It contains four pure grade cigars, uh, Peritos, as yep, they're called, um, featuring each component of the preferito blend from La Aurora. Uh, one preferito number three featuring all the pure grades in, uh, uh, blended together plus the wrapper. And one preferito Churchill that's a barber pole Churchill. I can't wait to see this cigar. It's 7 by 50 It contains the same four pure grades but with a sixth um, uh, segment. Cutter? What is that? S- uh, oh, is that? Six segments. Six seg- so it's oh. like six different wrappers. You go from one to the other, which ah, is really cool. I got you. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, Lara Cutter and Lighter Plus, a customer's choice, you'll be able to, after the blending seminar, uh, be able to buy the Preferito blends in a Corona size. Uh, you'll have uh, get to choose 10 from the six different wrappers. Oh, yeah. So six choices. You can build a box of 10. It's all priced out on stogiegeeks.com forward slash blending. So we'll make be sure talking a little more about it, I think, with Todd later on this afternoon. Yeah, Todd's going to come on. Yep, so we'll definitely that. talk more about that. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Will, um, who is good friends with our next very special guest, who I'm very excited to have on the show, Mr. Glenn Loop. Mr. Glenn, but before we get to Glenn, I just want to remind everyone we're looking for 100% participation here. Um, either sign up for Cigar Rights if you're not a Cigar Rights of America member uh, or renew your membership. We, we really need your support here. Um, we have the executive director of um, Cigar Rights of America who's going to give us an update um, on things, so you'll be hearing it firsthand. Glenn, uh, Will Cooper, and Paul Asadorian in Rhode Island, how are you doing today? Hey there, how are you, Will? Great to talk to you, and uh, as always, thank you for you know, the reminders of what I'm supposed to do next. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. We know you're very busy. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's been a really active week. Um, I'm going to get right to a couple of things before we turn to Capitol Hill, because I think there's a couple of battles right now that a lot of cigar enthusiasts are looking at. Um, the first one I want to talk about is what's going on in Nebraska right now with the um, with the cigar bars. And apparently there was a ruling yesterday that was a kind of a bad blow to the cigar industry. Um, why don't you tell our listeners a little about what that ruling was and what this could mean down the road? Well, it's uh, it's ugly, it's complicated, and it needs to be fixed. Um, it was actually the Friday of Labor Day weekend. I'm having a flashback that you know most of the world had was on either vacation or taking a day off and whatnot. And I'm on this you know Google Alerts thing for anything that says tobacco, smoke, cigar, anything of that nature. And that bloody thing popped up that the Nebraska Supreme Court had ruled against the exemption for cigar bars in Nebraska. And there's this clause, apparently, in the uh, Nebraska Constitution that really takes a narrow constructionist view of the word exception and special treatment, if you will. And the uh, Supreme Court ruled against the exemption that had been initiated and passed by the Nebraska legislature, had been signed by the governor of Nebraska, to provide a uh, smoking ban ex- exception for, for cigar bars. And uh, there's some beautiful one- lounges out there I've seen online and the like, and uh, a lot of money has been invested into creating uh, outstanding atmospheres for for cigar enthusiasts in Nebraska. And so the court came down and said, no, you can't do that. Um, The retail community uh, came together. Um, The attorney general of Nebraska initiated a a reconsideration of the court's decision. And that took about the last 30 days plus, 30 to 45 days. 
And then the court, as you noted, came down yesterday and said, no, you're still not going to get your ex exemptions. Um, Senator Scott Laudenbaugh of Nebraska, who spearheaded the initial ex exception for exemption for cigar bars as a member of the Nebraska Senate, and it's a unicameral legislature there. Everybody's a senator. And um, he's he's been a very passionate supporter of this cause from the very beginning. And now he's he's uh, either term limited out or didn't run again, and he is going to be assisting uh, with the legislature in in trying to get this fixed. Meaning that the only way to fix the court's decision is a legislative solution. So in January, that's what's going to happen. Um, on that Labor Day weekend, um, that Saturday, I was uh, I was in Miami and did a conference call. I think, it was, no, it was that Friday, I guess, uh, of that weekend. And I was in Miami on a fundraising tour and um, facilitated a conference call with, with our friends at IPCPR, <clears throat> excuse me, and the CAA. And, uh, you know, the, pretty much it was a hurry-up-and-wait moment because of the reconsideration movement by the Attorney General. So the conclusion of that call was, which I, I remember Taking, I, I did it from the My Father Cigar Lounge at um, at the My Father facility there in Doral, and um, I'm giving you all this nuanced background. <laughs> this goes into the. No, story. it's all good. It's all good. And um, and you know the the conclusion was that it would have to be a legislative solution. If the court didn't come down on the side of the cigar bars, um, you know, through the decision that came down yesterday, it would have to be a legislative solution. So the minority court opinion uh, helped map that out, and uh, that's what's going to happen, but it can't happen until the legislature convenes in, in January. So in terms of this right now, and this is, this, is a, this is bad. I mean, you're in Nebraska. You cannot smoke in a cigar bar right now. Basically, it's, it's, is, yeah. is there a, is there a, could this be something right now that has a domino effect with the other states right now, and is there anything we should be – on the short-term horizon that may may pop up with this? Or is this strictly something with the way with the Nebraska Constitution works? Well, it is a nuance of the Nebraska Constitution, but that has nothing to do with political semantics. And by that, I mean this. Uh, Any time that our opposition, the health care lobby, the body parts lobby, um, any time that they can get their claws into a precedent-setting measure, like Nebraska, they will not hesitate to try to initiate that, use it, twist it, turn it into their own image anywhere else in the country. Wow. That's just the way they behave. It's the way they act. And, you know, the same holds true for this case in, in uh, that case, this situation in Massachusetts. I don't know if you... That was the next one, that was the next one I was going to hit you with. Not, You're a mind reader. This week there was a dramatic, dramatic, chaotic public hearing in Massachusetts in the uh, city of Westminster that um, wanted to wants to ban, the Board of Health unilaterally wants to ban the sale of any and all tobacco products at the retail level. And there's, to my knowledge, there's no premium cigar shops involved in that decision, but that's almost irrelevant to the fact that one community in America outright wanted to ban commerce, a form of free enterprise commerce, by banning the sale of anything with nicotine in it, whether it was e-cigarettes, you know, cigars behind the counter, convenience store uh, products, cigars. But as you know, some of those some of those convenience stores sell premium cigars behind yeah, the absolutely. counter. And the fact that one community could try to set a precedent of that nature is equally as damaging and threatening. So uh, there's there's several that we can chat about during the course of this segment, but. Uh, I hope that fills you in on the Nebraska situation. There will be a legislative proposal uh, moving forward to fix this uh, situation. I, I noticed uh, a segment this morning where the uh, chairman of the Nebraska Liquor Commission was in a cigar shop, I, and he certainly sounded like he was a sympathetic soul, but said, you know, they've got to enforce the law, and either you ban the smoking or you, they yank your liquor license. Wow. Wow. So you're turning back to Westminster, because that was the other one I wanted to hit you on. Um, let me ask you, can they, I mean, can that actually happen? I mean, or could that somehow be, I mean, 
can that happen? I mean, is that a real, or is that just something that, I just think, like I said, if you're banning commerce, it's a legal product. Is that constitutionally something that can happen? All the lawsuits would have flown in the next 24 hours, but the, apparently from what I'm gathering on the segments is that this, this the hearing, I wish I could have been there. I swear to God, I wish I could have been there. <laughs> and I, I was so glad to see that my friend Tom Bryant, who's executive director of the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, was there. Um, I called this morning. Uh, Tom is one of the brightest people in this business. And I'm so glad he was at that hearing. And, uh, you know, the lawsuits would have been filed this morning if if they would have acted. But the hearing was so chaotic that the uh, the health public health board had to stop the hearing after, like, four speakers. And uh, she was complaining about no respect for the board, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know... When you try to bring socialism to America, that's what happens. Freedom of speech. <laughs> it's freedom of speech. You know what? It, it, sometimes it ain't going to be pretty. She couldn't handle the, if she couldn't handle the heat of the exchange, then she had no business making the proposal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know. You that's know, she, yeah. But that's cowardly. It's not yeah. over. And one of the problems in Massachusetts uh, that we learned literally, literally was one of the very first issues and battles we got drawn into at the, in CRA history in, in December of 2008 was the unilateral decision by the Board of Health in Boston to sunset the very existence of Boston cigar bars sure. and to ban patio smoking at, at bars and restaurants in Boston. Mm. And uh, God rest his soul, Mayor Menino died just recently that spearheaded that. Um, and what I'm getting to there is that places like Massachusetts, and the same is, is true in, in West Virginia, in a case that I was involved with recently, is that the boards of health have unilateral authority to make those decisions. In other words, it's not going to an elective body where there is no accountability. You've got unelected bureaucrats like in Massachusetts Board of Health and West Virginia Boards of Health at the local government level that have this power and they're not accountable to the public. And that's where, you know, elected officials have to stand for election. And if, I guarantee you it would have been a different dynamic last night in Massachusetts if that had been an elective city council instead of a board of health. Watching that crowd of people that's, you know, I was watching one speaker this morning who says, I cannot stand smoking. I cannot stand the thought of smoking. I think it's one of the most disgusting things in the history of the universe. But by golly, I think this proposal to ban the sale of illegal product stinks worse. It will set a precedent beyond belief. And if you think it'll go after tobacco, it will be something else after that. Yeah, the nanny state is alive and well. And I mm. say it a hundred times a day in a month. But uh, if, if, it's, if it's not us, it's cheeseburgers. If it's not cheeseburgers, it's Coke. If it's not Coke, it's trans fat, sugar, salt. <laughs> Glenn, I wanted I wanted to ask you about that. This is Paul. Um, we've been, uh, you know, I've been experimenting with the whole vape industry, and one of the things that I read was that the uh, vape industry has been criticized for the resocialization of smoking. I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that, and you know, if that uh, helps cigars or is indifferent or or what. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up in that context because I was doing a a series of congressional briefings yesterday with our, our mutual friends um, and Ezra Zion Cigars and, and Skip Martin with Rumacraft Cigars, and we were going around to the Texas delegation in Congress. And, um, you know, I pulled out an e-cigarette. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, this is what they're talking about. This is really what the FDA is anxious to get their arms around. And it goes to the very heart of exactly what you just said. They are scared to pieces of the, not uh, necessarily of the product, mm -hmm. scared to pieces of the psychological effect of the very notion of normalizing the appearance of smoking. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with, or little to do, shall we say, with, with health impact, with the scientific analysis of the product and, you know, the, are, they're imported from China or they're sold throughout the country at, you know, or could you give free samples out, et cetera, et cetera. It's the fact that you can run a television ad showing somebody putting 
a, a device like that in their mouth and having this appearance of smoke. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. that's that's what's got them scared out of their wits. And that's the reason that they're trying to expeditiously push this deeming regulation along. And it's not necessarily because of, of cigars or the, any purported threat of cigars. It's the get, getting their arms around the e-cigarette industry. Now, they've really tried to do a butcher job on us in the last five days in a PR campaign on cigars, and we can talk about that in a minute. But... Uh, um, it's it's more about psychology than science. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. No, that's interesting. <laughs> yep. So yeah, Glenn, I you then. So tell us a little about some of those things over the last five days that have happened, because um, I think there's some things I think the audience really needs to hear. Well, it's an absolute crock, Will. We're <laughs> 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 not a scientific way of putting it. Um, in the last oh four days, five days. Um, naturally, there's no accident. There's never an accident to the release of studies from the healthcare community. Never an accident. They are one well greased machine. And the real bear of that is that they're using, you know, tobacco settlement dollars and tax dollars to do it. So, you know, as a friend of mine and a retailer in, in California put it, we're the only industry that pays to put itself out of business. And, uh, so they crank out these studies, and they do it with a very intentional timing in mind. And uh, so, in the last several, in the last week, they put out a series of, based upon a study, a series of press releases about the harmful impact of cigars. Now, keep in mind, you know, in our filed public comment with the FDA, uh, we had Dr. Chris Coggins uh, go to great pains to make the case that there really isn't demonstrable specific evidence on the adverse health impact of, of cigars uh, within our community. Now, all of a sudden, now here it is, our country's been studying tobacco, you know, for decades upon decades upon decades. And in the original movement to try to get tobacco regulated by the FDA in the 90s, which seems like a lifetime ago, but in the 90s. Cigars were not a part of that. And, in fact, we cite that in our filed comment in August to the FDA that when the agency was first trying, 1994, was first trying to regulate tobacco, cigars were not included. And there's a reason for that. It's because of this term, you know, risk continuum on the level of threat that particular tobacco products you know, present. So boom, out of the blue, you know, this week, studies released about cigars loaded with harmful toxins. And I'm looking at headlines here. Cigar smokers exposed to harmful agents. And, uh, you know, cigars hurt you as much as cigarettes. Blah, 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 blah. And I, I, I've literally got a stack of these headlines in front of me. And... Um, And it all hit, of course, when? While the FDA is doing this review of the deeming regulation on cigars. No accident whatsoever. Mm, Absolutely. And no empirical data, right? No empirical data was provided here. You know, and I I literally just got emailed a full copy of the study. And I'm going to take it with me on the plane in in the morning. Um, But I've got a complete copy of the study. And we are preparing a, a formal public response Excellent. because, you know, this garbage cannot go unanswered anymore. And um, it, it's just ridiculous that we're having to go through that type of a diversionary exercise, and that's all it is. It is a diversionary exercise. Uh, and, on, and a way for a bunch of bureaucrats at the FDA to justify whatever action they would like to take against this, this great industry. So that's my two cents worth on what's happened in the last five days in Massachusetts and uh, Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is why we need all hands on deck here right now with everyone. Uh, this, is the, the, this is not, fighting this is not free. So we need everyone's support on this um, to really uh, participate. That's why we're asking for 100% participation on this. Now, now Glenn, in terms of um, the new Congress, 
So, I mean, we, uh, I'll admit in North Carolina we had a huge win because Tom Tillis is a cigar guy from what I've heard. And from my heard, Kay Hagan would never answer the cigar guys at uh, her office. So there's been changes in Congress. What's your assessment of things right now? I know it's bipartisan, um, but what do you see now with this new Congress coming into play right now? Well, we, we can break it down on a on a state by state base. <clears throat> excuse me, state by state basis. But to start where you did, I, I'm very excited about um, Senator Elect Tillis from North Carolina. Me too. I've heard the same thing. I've had numerous conversations with the tobacconist community in North Carolina about that. Um, I hope it works well. Um, obviously, there's going to be some pulling and tugging of interest there, but. From what I've gathered, uh, it's the same thing that you've heard. Um, I think we've got a, a nice chance of cultivating a, an ally there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The sinuses are killing me. Um, it's not all peaches and cream. Let's be clear about that. And I've been asked a thousand times since election night what the assessment. In fact, you know, a few manufacturers and I were texting back and forth till 2 a.m., on election night on what the implications are and what it means. The first thing I, w I would want to know publicly is that numerous members of the Senate that either are not coming back because of retirement or defeat um, have been allies of ours. And I've been very public in stating that. I've been public in stating that people like you know Senator Mary Landrieu from Louisiana, who's going to be in a runoff on December the 6th, has been a, a, a great public ally Absolutely. of ours. She has said things in committee in our defense. She has initiated language that is in our defense. And uh, some people don't like hearing that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. It's a documented fact. She's on video. She's in writing. She signed on to our legislation. She signed a letter to the FDA. Uh, as a part of the public comment, and I can't ask any more than that. Absolutely. Um, as you noted, you know, Kay Hagan didn't give us a time of day. Literally. No, she Literally. wouldn't. I, from you've told me that she would not answer. I mean, would not take an appointment if I'm not the mistaken. Last meeting we had, uh, I can say this. You know, now that it's all said and done. But uh, but the most pitiful staff meeting among the last three years has been in that office. Um, and you would think, you know, there's some, as you well know, some, some of the nation's great tobacconists are in the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we couldn't get the first base on that was, uh, was, was pitiful. I don't know whether it's pitiful on our part or their part, but I got a pretty good idea. Um, you know, you would just think some basic constituent service in that regard would have would have gotten us more. But uh, but that being said, here's where the lay of the land is politically with the new Congress. Because of the nature of the makeup and, and Senator McConnell coming in as majority leader, uh, with there being a stronger Republican House, and I say stronger in terms of a raw political context, not a partisan context. Um. Our best hope would be that there would be more of a macro, across-the-board, government-wide push against regulation as a whole, as opposed to just tobacco or just cigars. Um, my guess is is that it would be more of a conversation about you know whether it's coal or tobacco or energy or environmental issues or banking, finance, you know, all the things that are top of everybody's list when it comes to discussing government regulation, power, you know, going down the list. The, the, probably the grander hope would be that there would be an across-the-board push against many, many forms of government regulation, and we get caught up in that mix. And uh, that being said, I'm very pleased that at least uh, three sponsors or former sponsors of our House exemption legislation got elected to the Senate. Uh, Corey Gardner in Colorado, Tom Cotton in Arkansas, and Shelley Caputo in, in West Virginia have at one time or another been on our legislation to exempt, and now they're going to be United States senators, and I think that's a great entree for us for those three new members of the Senate. Throwing on top of that, uh, yeah, 
Shorty Cable of Havana Connections in Richmond, Virginia, did a great job of of uh, reaching out to uh, new congressman uh, Dave Bratt, who uh, defeated the majority leader Eric Cantor in a Republican primary in the fall, well, in the summer actually, uh, and uh, did some great outreach there. It's indicative of how cigar smokers and cigar retailers and the like have really upped the game, if you will, as to their level of political involvement. And, and we're playing the game now as never before in the history of the industry. And that's going to be the nature of our annual meeting on, on Monday in, in Miami, is that, again, talking about strategies for 2015 is um, is how this industry has evolved and changed. I, I've said it a thousand times. You know, if you really look at the history of the industry and the history of the anti-smoking movement, if the industry had started playing the game differently in the late 80s, early 90s, it would be a very different political landscape today. But we're not going to be the first industry and we're not going to be the last that claws its way back from political Armageddon. And the level of consciousness, the level of effort, the level of commitment of resources, the level of engagement with the cigar smoker, the, what, the level of engagement with the retailer, and God knows that what the manufacturers are doing, is building a momentum that can, that can really escalate itself and start to have a dramatic impact on both elections and the public policy process. And that's exciting. It really is. And, uh, and we're going to have some intriguing announcements that I'll put out uh, next week after the meeting on Monday that will be very intriguing to your listeners. Um, but it's going to be a way to really build a great deal of more momentum going into the 2016 presidential election. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's all. We definitely look forward to sharing that. So, Glenn, we got a couple minutes left. Paul, is there anything you want to cover? Um, uh, yeah, I just. What's the call to action, uh, Glenn, for all of our listeners? January of 2015, a new Congress will be coming into into Washington D.C. Fresh new set of faces, fresh new agenda, uh, more open to suggestion because they'll be new to the process. Um, everybody needs to know, every cigar smoker in this country needs to know who their member of the House and Senate are. And um, we're going we're gonna to put out a brand new letter to Congress. We've been sitting on it since the election because there was really no need to do, you know, a bold new set of outreach with the, with the lame duck Congress. We're working a lot of things behind the scenes right now during the lame duck, but, uh, but in terms of mass call to the public, uh, it didn't make sense to do anything until the new Congress comes into session. So when that happens in, in January, or whichever day they're, they're sworn in and set the calendar, we're going to release a new letter to Congress from the cigar consumers. And it's going to basically start like this. We know that the public comment period is closed with the FDA on the deeming regulation of premium cigars. But I want you to know how I feel about what they have proposed. And we're going to release that in mass. You know, during the course of the 112th and 113th Congress, we have facilitated over 450,000 uh, petitions and letters to Congress. Um, we all worked together to facilitate over 82,000 comments to the FDA, the vast majority of which were in favor of premium cigars and against what the FDA proposed, and over 40,000 petitions to the White House, uh, specifically against regulation of the industry. That's what it takes to create a grassroots movement to get our message across. So the call to arms, as you would put it, would be uh, in early January, uh, circulate in mass this letter, take it, sign it, put your zip code on it so they know it came from you as a constituent of that given congressman to let them know that you are fervently against what the FDA has proposed as of uh, 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday, April 25th, which ought to be lived in infamy as a date where the history of cigar smoking could potentially change in America. And we can't let that happen. So the battle begins anew in January, and right now we're all in laying the groundwork mode. We appreciate it. Glenn, as always, um, thanks for you know appearing on the Stogie Geeks. Thanks for your service as well. Um, remember, uh, www.cigarrights.org. Um, everyone, uh, for you folks to join today, renew for an extra year of membership. If you present proof of that to Stogie Geeks, you'll get an extra raffle for the box of San Cristobal Classicos. Glenn, thank you so much. Thanks, Glenn.
Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciate the opportunity and the exposure that y'all give the uh, the cause of cigar freedom. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. And with that, we're going to take a short break and come back with uh, Nick Malolo. Nick Malolo, yeah. It'll be coming up Nick next, Aragua. so stay tuned. Okay. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 